huge show about well, energy audits. Uh, all things to do with energy efficiency, energy audits, energy upgrades of one's home. Uh, Bob's company is going to explain a little bit about it in terms of what he runs into day to day and talking to homeowners, uh, trying to show them the return on uh, the investment. Uh, and we really need to get out the word to homeowners that it really is great opportunities for them in the long run to save money, be more comfortable. Uh, and uh, it's... it's uh, we're very pleased to have Bob here. So yeah. tell us a bit about the company. We'll get into it. Yeah. Well, actually, for us, we were very thankful for a very long, cold winter. <laughs> yeah, you it must have been very us. busy this yeah, winter. It was your fault. <laughs> <laughs> the ice dams and all that other stuff. Fun stuff. There's been a lot of ice dams. People spending a lot of money in the utility bills this year, and they're finally asking, "Hey, what can I do?" You said thirty percent more this year. Uh, on the average, people use about twenty-five, thirty percent <gasps> more fuel. Than I know the I did. Winter. I know I did, and wood. Yes, and I always support wood too because that's a great way to help heat a home compared to normal fuels. Absolutely. But a lot of it's the airflow that goes through your home that you don't think about. You can feel it, but you don't think about it. I always feel the airflow through my windows. Well, coming in <laughs> and going out, well, and going out with the the warm air. Well, if you have air going out, guess where it's going out. It's it's to my birds and to the bears that are in yeah. my backyard. Yeah. It actually flows up into the attic. Anywhere you have electrical wire, plumbing, gaps like that, that's where the air is flowing to. So you're creating global warming. And how do you determine where the... <laughs> <laughs> Al Gore loves this guy. <laughs> well, the birds do love you for keeping a warm exactly. attic and the squirrels and like the mice you. And yeah. The, yeah, exactly. Right. Well, Bob, let's get into it. You said that's where the air in part is going. How do you determine that? Well, the way we determine it is we can use infrared cameras along with a blower door, and we can actually see the air movement. And yeah. also when you get into an attic, it's quite visible because you'll pick up a piece of that pink insulation. You'll look underneath, and it's all brown and black, and you're like, well, what's this from? Yeah. That's actually from an air leak underneath, and, that fil and the insulation is acting as a filter to clean out the air before it gets into yeah. your attic. You can add more insulation, but it's not going to stop the airflow. And as this air is leaving into your attic, it's pulling cold air in from the lower levels. So this is where you may have noticed by the windows, you know, there's a draft coming in here, but it's not windy outside. Or that, they're all steamy yeah. looking. So that's air going up in your attic, and it's being pulled mm. in from the lower levels. So that's a key thing is to be able to seal up all those gaps to keep the air from flowing up there. You'll have less air being pulled in at the lower levels then. <sighs> Wow, you would have a fun time in my house. With your home, yes. You've oh. complained about your house before. <laughs> All that hot air is All going, right. hot air rises. Yes. And what's up in the, the roof, underneath the roof, is the attic, which, oh, my God. Right. So a homeowner says, okay, I want to find out where my heat loss is. I want to find out how to save energy, hopefully save money. Where do they go to first to get started? The first thing really is to get what's referred to as a home energy audit. And we're not there to try and catch you cheating on your energy bill, so don't worry about that. <laughs> How do you or cheat your, on an energy bill? An audit, tax, tax return. Exactly, the audit. So, uh, no, we're not investigating your energy uses and see if you're taking corners and things like that. But uh, the audit is really a whole analysis of your home from top to bottom to identify where the weaknesses are from the basement, up in the attic, the central part of the home. And we bring some key tools with us also to help identify where these issues are. There's a thing called a blower door test, and we put a big fan in a door, and we actually pull the air out of your house, and we can measure the airflow of all the air going through your home. And it's wow. measured in cubic feet per minute. Wow. And then we compare it to what it should be based upon the size of your home. So if we run this blower door test, and that number is far higher than what it should be, we know you're losing a lot of heat due to airflow. Mm. And think? then when that test is being run, we can also walk around the house and identify where that air is coming from. I was at an old house on Friday on Concord, and it, we, the homeowner was fascinated because in the middle of the second floor, there was a wood planking floor, and there was a loose piece of planking. He pulled the wood up, and just this huge rush of air came wow. running up. And this is right in the middle of the home. And I said, that's a cavity connected to the attic. Wow. I can imagine what else you must find <laughs> in these old homes with this, when you 
go do you find any ghosts up uh, in the attic and stuff i mean don't rule out old homes new homes too uh, we've well, worked on homes that uh you know brand new construction really nice very well designed run the blower doors they're way more excessive flowy so this is where contractors and such need to be educated especially in building homes you've got to be aware of stopping this airflow okay <laughs> Well, you, we ha have, you have, of course, lines. Bob, building codes and energy yeah. codes, and you're saying some builders are having difficulty meeting those codes or not understanding how the technology works. Explain that a little bit. It's a combination uh, of things that need to be done from the people building the homes to the contractors that are building them, the building inspectors also. And realize, you know, we have some towns around here, they have no building inspectors. So That's you've got true. to be aware of that. And then we have building inspectors that don't know what they're doing. They look in the attic, go, yep, you've got insulation, you're good. Uh, I think they did that to my house. <laughs> and so the Home Builders Association, of course, tries to provide education to the building industry in all these areas and facets when it comes to codes and particularly energy codes. And so that's one of the things that we do as well. So the homeowner says, okay, I'd like an audit and so forth. What does it cost? Different ways of going about it. If you do one from an independent person doing the audit outside of any programs, Copper Heaven's one's going to cost you anywhere between four and six hundred dollars, depending upon the size of your home, and that's going to depend on it too. The other part, there's some really neat energy programs available here in New Hampshire that most people aren't aware of, and it's all based upon qualifying for it. It's based upon how much fuel you use for the last 12 months per square foot of your home. Interesting. And so we try to identify the homes that are desperately in need of help. So by going through this calculation, we can see, I see a hand going up, me, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So it does a calculation and it all boils down to how much energy per square foot you use. And then by qualifying that home energy audit, then just costs you $100. It's a copay of that, and the utility pays the balance. Right. So you go through the utility. We we'll go through the utility mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. So like, PSNH would be, that's who we have. Yes. They would be the ones that would approve it or disapprove yeah. it or whatever. Yeah. They administer the program. It's called the Home Performance with Energy Star. Wow. So we come out and we do a do whole comprehensive this? audit. We followed very stringent standards set by PSNH and the utilities, but also what's called BPI, Building Performance Institute, with all their specifications. It's a two to three, sometimes four hour process of going through your home. There's a number of health and safety checks done too. Then we come back with a list of recommendations and proposals that are getting reviewed by PSNH or the utility to prove it. And then we come back with a report and your copay is 50%. And then we invoice them for the other 50%. Wow. So you get 50% of it paid for by the utilities. When is a good time to have these audits done? Before the winter? The before audit. the summer? Before the summer, actually year-round. We keep pretty busy 12 months a year. Really? At this time of year, it's a great time because we're all anticipating lots of hot weather this summer. Right. And as your heat builds up in the attic, it transfers through the normal minimal insulation you have up there and heats up the second floor. So that's in the summer when you're in home and that second floor just seems really hot. Always. That is heat coming from the attic down into the second floor. Heat will always move to cold. Interesting. So See, the normal reaction is, if I have a really hot upstairs, well, I'm going to call my air condition company. Hey, can you come in and put enough AC in here to keep my upstairs cool? And there's your energy going right out the door. <laughs> your energy bill. Air yep. conditioning is not cheap to run. So then run. they have to run more electricity to run the air conditioning to keep it cool. Yeah. So it's a vicious cycle that you're yeah. buying into. Got to remember that. Heat always wants to go to cold. See, now that's interesting because we all learn, right? Heat rises cold air drops you're saying that heat up in the attic is trying to find the cold air yes it's the molecular structure and the density of them and the more dense are always looking for the less dense and that's why they wow. move there you go. heat always moves to cold so 50 percent paid by the utility yes if you go through the program and are approved how does one finance that 50 percent if they don't have the cash there are sometimes funding available right now to the utilities do have money available that you can actually finance this work uh, for a loan up to about five years, up to $7,500 at 0%. Wow. So in those cases, if you're able to take a loan like that at the 0%, the money you're not spending on fuel to heat and cool your home, you then use that money to make the payments. 
And do you, in the report, uh, give a suggested uh, payback schedule? Yes. In the report, it's a payback and an estimate of the quantity of fuel that you'll save also. And mm-hmm. then we base the pricing upon the current uh, New Hampshire Office of Energy Planning. We use their pricing to determine you know, how many dollars you'll save. So what would be the average? We're talking cost and 50% and all that. What is the average cost of, say, a 4,200-square-foot home in Amherst? What would be the... <laughs> Anybody you know? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody. What would be that average cost of having an energy audit? Uh, the cost to have the audit done, again, if we go through the program, it's $100, irregardless of the size of the home. Okay. So, so in some cases, we have a small home. We get through it quickly. Sometimes we have a larger home, and it takes a while. Uh, contemporary homes with all the different roofs and all that can be very challenging, the different walls that are in there. Um, so it will probably take four hours, and it's still a $100 fee at a wow. 4,200 square foot home. Now, certain elements of the report, the audit, will say you may have to, we suggest you do this, 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 maybe three or four different items. Can you assign a payback or yeah, a payback to any of those individuals so a customer can choose and say, okay, even at 50%, and I know payback, I can't do the whole thing, but I can knock this one off yep. or that one off. And that's actually part of the report that goes to the utility program is what we use. They list it, uh, and they will show you the break even by category, so all the work up in the attic. What's the total cost there? What's your cost for that work? How much fuel will you save? And what's the break-even on that one component? Interesting. Now, what about windows? windows. That's a very expensive proposition yeah. if you find out that all your windows, which I think ours are, are really uh, bad. Let's talk about windows. <laughs> Go ahead, Let's Bob. talk about windows because that everybody's, uh, I, you know, they're laymen like myself yeah. looking at their home. Oh, well, that's where all the... Hot air is going. My heat is going right out the drafty mm. windows. Window salespeople are very good in convincing you that's the worst that, problem. I've heard this. To replace it. <laughs> and what's scary is sometimes they don't call us beforehand, so they spend a lot mm-hmm. of money on windows. And then they said, you know, something else is what's wrong here. And they'll call us up, and we're like, well, remember all those drafts going up in your attic, pulling cold air from below? The windows don't stop that. And it's also how the window is installed makes a big difference. So if the window is installed, they have that gap between the window and the framing, uh, low expansion foam should be used. And if it's not, if there's just stuffing that pink insulation in there, air is still going to come right around the windows and into your home. And I just had a homeowner two weeks ago that had spent a lot of money, $15,000 on brand new windows. Sure enough, I find this bag of pink insulation they're using to stuff between the window and the framing. And I says, will you call that window contractor back? You have him take all the trim off, remove all the pink insulation, and use low expansion foam. You know what, Mark? When you put me out my windows, I was like, oh, my God, my windows. We're going to have to replace them all. And Bob is telling me, uh-uh. Maybe not. Maybe no, not. I, I don't think so. I don't want to make the window guy. You know, I have nothing against the window guys. Everybody has to work, but not on my dime. And windows are pretty expensive oh, they're to not replace. They're not cheap. Yeah, and a lot of the homes we go into, that's the biggest complaint because, it, again, the window salespeople have convinced the homeowners that this is your problem where all your heat loss is happening. And I've been into these homes where they replace the windows and still complain of the drafts that we were just talking about. And that's drafts coming around the window because they were improperly installed. And also, the air is still flowing up into the attic and pulling air in from the basement. Uh, and that's the draftiness they're feeling. Well, let me, ex- let me tell you my house, Okay. My house was built um, back 1978, okay? Quality. It really is quality built. However, it's the original windows. You go up into our attic. There's no insulation in the eaves at all. I see the nails from the thing. Is that also a loss of heat? Well, your boundaries then is on the attic floor. Is what we refer to as the attic plaque is where your insulation is. Right. So that's your boundary, and above that is defined as outside, so you don't need insulation above that. But you want to make sure on that attic floor there is sufficient insulation. Most homes I go into have an R value of about R20 and plenty of air going through it. And energy code is R49. And through these energy programs, we get them up to R50 or R60 is what you need. So most homes have half the insulation of what should be up in the attic. What if somebody wants to go above R60? 
if you go above R60, it's not really cost effective. Uh, beyond that point, it really doesn't make a difference. Now, I will tell you personally in my own home, not because it was the most energy efficient thing to do, but when I plan to sell my home, I'm selling it as an energy efficient home. So Which I blew in. Now. So I added in a total of R75 worth of insulation. So when people are looking at my house, they're going to see all that insulation in the attic and I'm going to promote it. So hopefully they'll look at the other homes and go, hmm, something's wrong here. And my did it more to help educate people when I go to sell my house what to look for in terms of energy efficiency. Interesting. Now, in your house, do you have up in the eaves of the roof? Do you have insulation? No, it's on my attic floor, what I refer to as the attic flat. The attic flat. Yeah. What about, I always, I go up into my attic, freeze to death in the in the winter, and then I can't breathe in the summer because it's so <laughs> hot. But we have that vent. It's a big, I, I, and I'm like, that's, that's the air out there. Yeah. Cold, freezing air coming in and the hot, hot air in the summer coming. What is the point of that? The point of that up in your attic, do you use it for storage and you're up there a lot? Yes. Okay. Uh, right now, the way the homes are built, that is defined as outside space. And there should be enough ventilation in there in the summer so the heat doesn't really build up a lot. So you have ventilation towards the top of that roof. So that's what normally referred to as a ridge vent. And then along the very edge, you should have what are called soffit vents that allow airs to flow into the attic. You probably don't have them in your house. You probably have I don't. gable louvers in the ends of the house. That's what they are. Which, which they don't work. Yeah. You, you right, think? Bob? Right. They don't work. And well, then, the, the birds like it. But the idea <laughs> is, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, the idea is that unconditioned space, that attic space, is supposed to be, supposed to be the same temperature as outside. Am I correct? That is correct. There you go. Supposed to be. So if it's freezing cold in the winter, mm -hmm. it should be freezing cold in my attic. Yes. And if I walk up to an attic, it's warm in the attic and cold outside. That's all heat that you're paying for, and it shouldn't be heating up that space. That's not the sun heating up your attic in the wintertime. <laughs> That's the heat we from below. So when I walk in the attic, I want to be cold. If I feel it's warm up there on a cold day, I know there's a lot of heat coming up from within the home. Okay, now, let's stay with the, with the attic or with the eaves of the, the roof. Okay, the roof, we had our roof replaced, and they told us we needed air uh, vents. I don't know what they're called. Mm -hmm. At the peak, you know? It's called a ridge vent. Mm -hmm. Ridge vent, that's right what right along the very top of the roof. Exactly. We didn't have them. So you need ridge vents, and then why? you... Why? Why? That will allow the warm air from the top going all across the attic to allow it to rise up and out of the attic. And as it leaves, it should be pulling cooler air in from the lower levels. And that's normally on the very edge of the attic. You have things that are called soffit vents. And the number of attics I get into is they're actually covered with insulation, so it's slowing down the air flowing into the attic. I can see the ground from my the, the soffits in the attic. Then you may have soffit vents in there, which is good. But you need the ridge vent to make sure that the proper yeah, PSI is created and so forth. Yeah. Now, the other part you want to make sure is when you have these soffit vents, they put like a plastic chute or eave or on this, and they stick it on the ceiling so the air can flow from the soffit vent up and around the insulation. But a lot of times when I'm in attics, I can look and I can see below that chute, which means wind is blowing right into the insulation, making it ineffective on the edges. In fact, it can start to blow it in towards the center of the attic. So you need to put also wow. what are called blockers in there so the wind comes through the soffit vent, it's not blowing into the insulation. Speaking of insulation, which is better, that old-fashioned, what, what is that, that the, the pink guy? the uh, Pink Panther? The Pink Panther. <laughs> Owens Corning. Oh, there we go. Is that better than blown insulation? What is blown insulation? Well, blown insulation, you can have both fiberglass blown in insulation, and you can also have cellulose blown in insulation, which is recycled paper material mixed in with a natural salt. Uh, so if you're one that you like to take care of your animals, you can add fiberglass up there. It's got chemicals in it and stuff, but the rodents love to nest in it, and it's got chemicals in it. If you <laughs> which is, <laughs> they, they if you cellulose insulation, it <laughs> if you cellulose insulation, it's got that natural salt in there, and rodents don't like to nest in salty material. Interesting. And it doesn't have the chemicals in it. In fact, we had one owner who was trying to demand that we blow in fiberglass insulation. The owner of our company said, no, we will not do it. Then we have to go through and clean out all our equipment to get rid of all the fiberglass insulation that's in the, in the machinery. 
And then there's also safety sheets you can print out of material. So the first one I grabbed, one of the warnings on this fiberglass blown insulation, where there was known components known to cause cancer. So you would advise now, if anybody's thinking about doing insulation, to go with the non-chemical, the yeah. recycled paper. Even though the rodents love it. And would that, Bob, also be the case if an exterior wall in an older home, through your energy audit, you yeah. note that, hey, there's no insulation there. Blown cellulose in the exterior wall you would recommend as well? I would highly recommend it. Okay. Doesn't and, settle. And, and believe me, uh, I do find homes that have no insulation in the walls. My daughter's Mind home. Up. <laughs> my daughter's home. She just bought, she and her husband bought a home uh, in December. Yeah. Beautiful old home, colonial, down in uh, Massachusetts, and they had uh, an energy audit done, mass saved. Yep. Uh, and indeed, there was absolutely no insulation in the exterior walls, very little, almost nothing in the in the attic floor. Yeah. So again, they're going to go through and have uh, some work done, and they're going to be incredibly pleased with yep. the return on the investment. Yep. And with the exterior walls, we take like, if you have vinyl siding, we take a strip of that off. We take like a three-inch hole into each of the bay areas. And we use a hose. We pack this in underneath pressure. So it's not fluffed in. It's packed underneath pressure. So it's not going to settle. It's not going to settle. In fact, yeah. it's, if you touch it, it's like a very hard, firm mattress when we're done. And it packs it in very tightly. And there's some really neat benefits. The rodents can't travel through the walls anymore. It will also do some soundproofing. And also, and I haven't checked with insurance companies, but a fire is not going to go through an exterior wall cavity anymore oh. because this material is packed in. So the air can't flow, and it's fire-resistant. And those are usually done, I assume, Bob, in very old homes, old balloon frames. Yes. So therefore, you can fill the whole cavity. But what about if there's, if there's blocking in the wall? How do you determine that so you might not miss a gap? This is where an experienced crew comes into hand and use some equipment to help identify this because they will know by using their hose and the mount going in, they can start to tell where there might be something blocking it. So at that point, they know, well, now we have to take a strip of vinyl siding off above that so we can now increase. And then by using an an infrared camera, we can also see the weaknesses in the walls. And that is showing the difference in temperatures between hot and cold. So if we can see on a really cold day from the outside and we see one part of the wall is really warm, we know we missed that part with insulation because the heat's coming out there now. Now, infrared cameras can be used year-round? Uh, you need approximately a 15 to 20 degree difference. Differential, okay. Now, what's fun is on a hot summery day when it's 90 degrees outside, if the inside of the house is about 75 degrees, we got about a 15 degree difference, then we need to flip-flop the colors because then you start looking where warm is, that's not good. Versus in the winter where we see warm, that's where ah. we put the flag up. But your, your target is 20 degree differential. 20 degree 15 degree, you'll get yep. iffy maybe. Yeah. So in the well, summer months, the best time to have an audit is actually early morning. And that's if it's normally cooler outside than it is inside. Or you wait till the middle of the afternoon if the person has air conditioning and it works very well that way too. What, <clears throat> excuse me, what about where, where, my property is it's all shade i mean we have a lot of mold problems we have a lot of moss problems because there's not enough sunlight that gets through these huge pines does that make a difference on temperature as far as especially in the summer yeah using infrared camera does make a difference in your case it would help because it's shading you don't have the sun hitting your house right creating that kind of warmth that's kind of like a fake warmth for us so it's best to do it. And when you do infrared cameras, try and make sure the sun is not shining on the surface. Because at that point, the sun's warming up the surface. It's not your house warming it up. Exactly. Interesting. You're learning a lot, Glenn. I am learning. This is like, I hope my husband's listening to this because. <laughs> <laughs> send, a, send him the podcast. <laughs> he really, we were talking about, because I said that we were going to have an energy audit person, yeah. guest on. And he's like, oh. <gasps> Oh, really? That is what – and then he goes on to say, you know, we, we, they do this, they do that. Our house is – you want to do a trade? Yeah, that's fine. I can educate you. This is what I see here. Here's the issue. Here's the solution. You mentioned kitchen. That is a, that is a prime area where heat and cold air is lost in, in, in ventilation through your stove and stuff. like. I, I mean, I find a lot of drafts. That's a very good segue into a good 
section of questions, I think, for Bob, and that is ventilation. Yep. What do you do? I mean, you have bathroom fans. The older houses, you tried to exhaust it out, but, of course, they put in undersized fans. Tell us about air exchanges, ventilation. Yep. Air exchanges are very important for a home, and you want to make sure that you have enough ventilation on you know, nature can handle to make sure you have a health and safety home. So part of what this audit test does, when we run that blower door, we can measure the airflow and compare it to what it should be. And if it's where it should be, then we don't really want to block any more airflow unless we make sure that you're using bathroom fans to pull the moisture out of your house. If you have kitchen fans to pull the moisture out of the house also. Because if you don't do these things and you seal a home too tight, you will have health and safety issues down the road. Oh, sure. And I actually had a very first, uh, the other day, is I actually did a test on a home and I'm still baffled. It was actually tested right before mechanical ventilation is required. Meaning it's an automated procedure to bring cold air in and release cold, warm air outside, even though the warm air heats up the cool air as it comes in. So that was the very first home that was actually buttoned up very tightly that almost required. So this is all part of the energy audit that when we start seeing you don't have bathroom fans, we actually require through this program you put bathroom fans in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're sized properly. And they're sized. And then also the utility programs will pay for 50% of a new installation of a bathroom fan. There you go. Really? And then we vent it through the roof. So you're not blowing the moisture into the attic, which is very common. Let me tell you. You just took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> I want to tell you a little story. This goes back many, many years, 25 years or so when I was in the building business. I'll make it as quick as possible. I was called into a homeowner's uh, place where they were having interior moisture problems. And what I discovered is that they were heating the home with a very large wood stove in the basement. Home was nice and warm. They also had their clothes dryer in the basement. And rather than vent it outside, they vented it into the basement. And so all of that moisture was rising up, of course, and then finding a place where it would condense, where it reached its point of condensation. That happened to be on the underside of the roof. It was a cathedral ceiling, mm -hmm. moisture dripping everywhere. Well, to add, add to your story, I have sometimes gone into attics and I look up Ugh. and it's all ice crystals. Or mold. Well, this is, yeah, it will turn to mold, but yeah, this well, is actually right. the warm, moist air that has risen has hit the cold surface and turned and to ice. ice. Well, that, I've seen that in my attic. As a matter of fact, talking about the, the ventilation in the, the, the bathroom, we never had any. We had one put in. Well, he ventilated it going into the attic and i'm like okay this is great why isn't it going outside because it there, there's a wall that it could have gone out yeah. he's like oh it, that's gonna cost you da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. well he's probably for the last 30 years been venting it into the attic so that's what he said to me he's like we've always <laughs> done it this way and so you can see frost probably up there on the side of the rafters mold there you yeah. go. big time mold so well, now that's I, I a have, whole issue i have a couple companies i work with that do very good at mold remediation Good, because our house, I, I can see the mold now coming through the clabbered, clapboards. Yep. Yeah. Again? Really? Do we have to? Is it necessary? No. <laughs> Tim's trying to make me take a break. I, I can't. This is, too, this is too <laughs> fast. We're on making on an right executive now. decision. No. <laughs> right now. We don't need roll. one. So, yes, you're now learning an awful lot uh, about the energy uh, usage and how to save and what the ramifications are of not having your home insulated and air sealed properly. Uh, and that's what we want to get out in terms of, of consumers learning about this yes. because it's, they will learn to uh, what can be done, how it's to be financed. Well, save money. Hello. Save money. Make it healthier. And it'll have a more comfortable home. Right. Yeah, because we literally this winter went through four cords of wood using our wood burning stove, which is downstairs, not in the basement, but on top of using our heat, which we all know the fuel problems we had this year. I'm not mentioning any names because we were <laughs> victims of it, but anyway, um, it's the the energy alone. I was going to ask you, Bob, what is a – in back in the 70s, the uh, heating was forced hot air, which is what we have. Yep. I hate it. I would love to go uh, – my first home we bought, 
1940s radiation, radiator, yep. radiators. The, the best, most efficient, I mean, it kept the house so warm. This hot air is awful because as soon as the heat goes off, the house gets cold very quickly. Yep, and that's the air again leaving your home that you've just heated up. Also, when you have forced hot air, you've got a duct system. Yes. Now, quite frequently, we see ducts that are not sealed correctly. In other words, you've actually ducts running through the attic, running through the basement, and your warm air is just blown outside the living space. So you need to make sure all those ducts are sealed up correctly. In fact, I was at home the other day. I found duct tape wrapped around the ducts. There you go. That's what ours have. That's why they're called ducts and duct yeah. tape. <laughs> and that's why you're not supposed to use duct tape on ducts. It, <laughs> it dries. On quackers or... <laughs> it, it dries up and falls off. That's what all of our... All the, the, the ventilating, the, the whatever it's called, it's it's all duct tape. I think your home's going to take more than four hours to look through. <laughs> but you should, it's worth you, it. You should do it. Bob, uh, during your audit, do you also take a look at appliances, heating, heating, you know, furnaces, uh, electrical switches, lighting? Is that a part of the audit? Part of the audit is taking a look at the heating system and testing for carbon monoxide because that's a health issue. Uh, if a system's putting in a lot of carbon monoxide, believe me, we don't want to reduce the airflow in the home, so that is part of the testing. We also test to make sure a heating system is drafting correctly if it's pulling air from the basement to get out. Because um, if it's not drafting correctly, we don't want to reduce the airflow in the home. It's just going to get more gases in the house, so these are things we test for. We get into individual appliances. If I see another olive colored refrigerator, uh, oh, hello. <laughs> My first refrigerator. My, I was going to say. Avocado. So, <laughs> Avocado. So a neat thing to do, and you may wonder, how much electricity do these devices really use? There's a device you can check out of any library here in New Hampshire. It's called a kilowatt. K-I-L-L-A-Watt. And it's an electric meter. You can plug it into an appliance. You can see how much electricity it's using and measure it in kilowatt hours, how much it uses. Now. Wow. So the olive color refrigerator, believe me, gets very expensive per year to run. That second refrigerator, <laughs> if it's still running. <laughs> that second refrigerator down in the f basement, which is normally the olive color one, doesn't need to be there usually. So this kilowatts a great way to measure how much electricity something is using, be it turned on or turned off. Now I go into homes and I find these nice entertainment centers. They got all these electronic things. You know how often do you have your entertainment center on? Oh, well, maybe three hours a day. And I said, well, about 21 hours a day then, you're paying for electricity with that turned off. They're like, well, how much electricity? I said, we'll use this device called a kilowatt, and we'll measure for that particular system. So I educate homeowners about that. What's the term of that when an appliance is off, supposedly, but still drawing power? There's a term for that. Oh, I like to call them the vampire loads. Right. Or ghost <laughs> loads. Yes, yeah, ghost. Or phantom yeah. loads. Phantom yeah. loads, yes. And is that the, true for televisions and, you know? Very much so. That is 10 to 15% of your electrical usage are these things turned off, sucking up electricity. Even cell Even phone. Even cell phone chargers. Really? So mm -hmm. with my cell phone, when I charge it, I have a little box I put on my outlet that I plug my cell phone in, I hit a button, and then after three hours, it automatically unplugs. Oh. <gasps> In, in, is this like also for computer? I mean, think about oh, what yeah. a house has today yep. that didn't have 20 years ago. They make what are called energy-saving surge protectors for your desktop computers. So when you put your computer in a sleep mode, hibernate, or turn it off, it automatically unplugs the other devices for you. Oh. And you don't have to learn anything new. That's the beauty. OMG. <laughs> <laughs> The other really? big thing is going with LED lighting. It will use about one-sixth or one-tenth of conventional electricity of your incandescent light bulbs. Now, they can get rather expensive, but if you keep your eye on them, you can replace them. I just did all my home lights in my house, except for the fancy ones of all LED. We just and did the same thing. Now, that's not compact fluorescent. That's nope. LED. Explain LED. the difference for those okay. who are listening. Uh, with CFL compact fluorescent lamp, it's similar like those big tube lamps that you have, but it's just compact and I, it looks like a pig's tail to me. And then also like the, the curly, the pigtail, curly one. And then inside there, there is a small trace of mercury. And then with those light bulbs, when you turn them on, it likes a warm up time. And most of us are impatient for that. I don't know why. Uh, yeah. And then they claim to, forever. And then they claim to be dimmable, which they're not really dimmable. So the LEDs have been out for a while. It's not new technologies, but they'll use about one-third the electricity of these CFL light bulbs. There's no mercury in them. You turn the switch on, all the lights are on right away, which is great. 
and you can dim them. And, and the CFLs do not last as long as they are nope. advertised in some cases. I know. I've got some recessed cans, eyeballs. Yep. And they're supposed to last a long time because you spend a lot of money. They don't. Yep. Well, sometimes they could be overheated. That's probably the case. That's one of my that's electricians. The because you yeah. have a can designed not to have insulation around it, and you've yep. got insulation around it. I do. Right. Lots of it. See, and the LED- there's another insulation And that's issue. where the LEDs are better because they generate less heat. Right. Exactly. My friends and neighbors have gotten used to now, like, driving back to Home Depot and turning in their used uh, bulbs. But that warm-up time is what they don't like. <laughs> there are times you're using lights just for a few seconds for, for example, uh, an entranceway at night or going from the right. carport to the garage. You'd like to flip on the light and have the light. That's where the LED is needed over the Instead, CFL. Right. This is a great point right. you fellows yeah. have brought up. Right. And right now, those prices have gone down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I well, did isn't mu- it required now? I, I thought they got rid of the 40 and the 60, and you have to get these... Are they phasing out incandescent? Uh, I think they were trying to phase out the 100-watt incandescent light bulb first and then work their way down. You know what? In all honesty, I hate the way they look. They remind me of fluorescent. I just I just put them in my kitchen in the in the baluster, whatever they're called. These are the the CFL light bulbs. Yes, and I just don't like the you know you you can get blue. It depends. Now I'm a photographer, so the lighting (laughs) is the blue, or you can get the yellow. So. Uh, the LEDs come in the proper color lighting, too, with the warm brown, That's so it's I not heard. the bright white. In fact, the first way I tested two of them in my kitchen, I replaced two of my recessed cans with LEDs and didn't tell the wife. She did, did she no- notice it? She did not See, notice I it. noticed she it. She did not notice it. I saw it immediately. I was like, ew, it looks like... But she did you not get notice used the difference. To that. It's, yeah, I like... I actually like them much better now yeah. because they, they're more concentrated of a yeah. light beam. And then in my recess lights, I lucked out over Thanksgiving. I got them for like $10 each after the rebate. Wow. So any recess light, including my exterior ones, I replaced with yeah, LEDs. Now, there are rebates when people yep. buy. They have to find the little form and send it in. Uh, there's even ways to buy without going through the rebate form. If you go to the NH Safe site, right. you can order online and get the instant rebate. In fact, a great deal available that right now is a light bulb equivalent to a 60 watt. It's an LED light bulb, and with the rebate automatically applied, your cost is two dollars and ninety eight cents each. Talking cost. If I was to go and get this whole energy audit that we were talking about, um, the hundred dollar fee, is there still the credit? You get on your tax return the IRA is, is is that still in effect or Not doesn't effect. it count? Wish it was though. Used to be. Yeah. Used to be if you got your house energy efficient yeah. in all sorts of ways. Well, you can take take the credit on your New Hampshire uh, income tax return. Oh, we don't have it in New Hampshire. That's right. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> That was a trick Got to I, uh, I, I, I was catching uh, that. Unless you have a certain amount of interest or dividend right. income. Right. This is true. That you are taxed on that they don't tell you about. That's that right. is exactly right. That was a trick question. That was yeah. tricky. I saw you. I could tell in your by your <laughs> eyes, Kendall. <laughs> and just to give you an example of, of like a home, I use my own home. It's not something I did overnight to get this work. But in the heyday when we had two kids home, we would go through 1,200 to 1,500 gallons of oil a year mm-hmm. plus two cords of wood. Yep. Not this winter, but the previous winter, we used less than 500 gallons. And that's before I did all this wow. weatherization work. And then this past spring, I did all the weatherization work. And I'm estimating for this winter, we'll use about 650 gallons of oil fuel for heating the home through the winter months. Wow. So that's it, it can be done. And this is a well-built home built in the mid-1990s, high-end construction. But these are all things I have done to reduce it. That doesn't mean you have to kick your kids kids out of the house to do this, though. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? I like them being in because I, ch- I I charge them some rent to, to help cover the fuel costs. I mean, you have two. I have two daughters. Yeah. Taking showers five times a day, do doing a, their hair. Do you have a low flow sh- shower head? No. I can't. Well, I don't do, like you know those. What this, do you know what this hundred dollar audit also includes? We can. Do replay- we get a gift? <laughs> Well, it's a new promotion right now they put in is any of your high usage incandescent light bulbs you have. In other words, you use them more than three hours a day, like in your kitchen. We'll replace those with LED light bulbs at no charge. If you want a a standard shower head, we'll put in a low flow at no charge for doing those. And then low flow aerators through like bathroom sinks and places like that also. And that's all included in the energy audit. 
explain explain this to me. What is a low flow shower head? Well, it is set up to use a lot less more gallons per minute on a flow wise basis compared to what's normally installed. And if you look at the cost of water, if you have to buy your water, you reduce that cost. If you have to heat the water and pay for it, you reduce right, that. That's... Even if you're on a private well, you're still using electricity to get the water yes, out are. of the ground. That's right. So these are all places when you model it, it's very cost effective. But doesn't it take you longer to rinse the soap out of your hair? And with these, the pressure is different. Well, the original ones were like these little misters that came yeah. out. Yeah. And they're not like that anymore. Really? Yeah. It's like the toilets. Okay, the, I have to flush my toilet four times, and it's supposed to be energy efficient. Right? Well, they have come a long way, I will say that. <laughs> because, it, you know, you the, the, those low-gallon yeah, whatever low, it is. Low-flow toilets. So, yes. so with kids, if you don't put in a coin-operated shower, I'd put in the low-flow shower head. <laughs> yeah, especially girls washing their hair a billion times. And then but what I also have on my shower is actually flow control to control the total flow of the water also. We so have versus that. turning the water on and off, you can yeah just you turn, adjust the flow that way. Okay, and so I do have that. Head, yeah. I've never used it, though. My husband uses it to shave. See, see, if you use the low-flow shower head, you don't have to do anything. It just works. Interesting. There's no buttons to push.